Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might join, be joining us today from around the world or viewing us on an archive. We are super excited to have Amina Bell from Your Part-Time Controller on to talk about the realities of donor-restricted contributions. This is going to be a great conversation because it's one of those things that's fraught with a lot of hmm, challenges, maybe I should say. But I mean, it's going to help us understand how it all works and how we can deal with it. If we haven't met before, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jared Ransom, the nonprofit nerd CEO of the Raven Group, is off today. She's actually doing a, um, a board retreat, I believe. And so she'll be back with us. Uh, tomorrow. Again, we are here each and every day now marching towards 750 episodes because of our sponsors, plain and simple. And those friends of ours include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and the Nonprofit Nerd. If you would like to get to any of our archives, whether you can join us it, on Sunday in your PJs while drinking some coffee or during work because you've got to figure out a problem, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, and Vimeo. We have channels on all those portals. And we also now have the nonprofit show on podcasts. So we started doing this uh, this last year. Super excited. That we, I think, achieved, Amina, 10,000 downloads in our first Wow. Six months. So um, cue us up. And if you want to pop us into your ears, we'll join you right there. Okay, Amina Bell from Your Part-Time Controller. We have you down here as associate, but you have some exciting news because something big happens tomorrow, right? Yes. So uh, thank you for having me here, Julia. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Um, yeah, and I've been an associate with YPTC. Um, I've been with YPTC for 10 years um, now, and I'm moving into a new role of strategic partnerships. So I'll still be doing client work, but also helping out with our business development portion. So I'm really excited to be involved with, with that aspect of the business. Wow. Now your part-time controller works with nonprofits throughout the country where, and they're, they're all over, um, mm -hmm. including some folks um, in my community, which by the way, I was at an event on Friday night and sat in the table right next to um, the YPTC table. Nice. In a giant ballroom. I was like, wow, okay. This is like <laughs> but anyway, where are you coming to us from? What city? I am coming out of the Houston area. So in our Texas, Louisiana, uh, uh, Arkansas market. Wow. Okay, cool. Wonderful. Well, let's get into it because I have so many questions. Um, this is such a hot topic, but I feel like we need to back up the bus a little bit and have you help us to understand what the definition of donor I started to say droner, <laughs> Don <laughs> Woo, that Freudian slip, donor restricted contributions are and, and how we should look at this before we move into the conversation. Absolutely. I think that's a great place to start. Um, so a, a restricted contribution is a contribution where a donor imposes some type of parameter about how that contribution should be used. And normally we kind of put it in two buckets. It can be purpose restricted. So the donor is indicating uh, a specific use, like I want my contribution to be used for kids' backpacks. Um, or um, it could be for a specific program. Um, and then the second bucket is imposing a time restriction where the donor is placing a specified time period on when the donation can be used. And that can be temporary or permanent in, in, in nature as, as in the case of um, endowments. Um, but it, donor restrictions should be um, really contrasted with designations, internal designations um, that sometimes management imposes um, such as a board reserve, or um, if they get donations and they may designate the funds to be used for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. In terms of accounting, the only 
restrictions that we count as a restricted contribution is one that a donor imposes. So it must come from the donor. So it's really what I hear you saying. It's a world of two reckonings in that you have your uh, accounting and the fiduciary aspect as well as then you have a management aspect. Absolutely. Right. Yes. And, but the management aspect can always be changed. The restriction <laughs> for a particular donor cannot be changed without <laughs> permission from that donor. So, yeah. you know, um, and this might be a little bit of a curveball, but are you seeing more and more donors using attorneys and legal frameworks to make sure that they're asserting exactly what it is that they want versus just a conversation? You know, I, I'm seeing, not necessarily in my personal experience, more attorneys, but more documentation um, where the donor is spelling out their intentions um, or more language around, hey, if this is what you say you're going to spend it on, we're going to kind of hold you um, in terms of your reporting to this is what you spent it on. Wow. So that really gets us into the part of, of this discussion calling you know, honoring donors intent. And it seems to me, and in what we're, we're living in this perfect world right now, this example of COVID, you know, think right. of all the people that were like, no, I, my money's going to go to X, Y, and Z, and then COVID hits. And then all of a sudden things changed because we had different needs. Right. How does that work in relationship to what that original intent was and how do we navigate that? Yeah, so, um, you know, once a nonprofit decides to accept a, a, a donor restricted contribution, they have, they have a legal re uh, obligation to fulfill that donor intent. Um, and if for some reason, because I had a few clients as well during COVID where the needs drastically change, yeah. they just, they went to the donor and they said, hey, because more often than not, the donor is wants to support the mission. They they want to support the organization. Having that conversation, like these are where our changing needs. Can we can you release these restrictions? Um, and and they were very successful in doing that. Um, and then just documented that in writing. Um, but if you don't get that. You, there could be potential repercussions. Um, there could be lawsuits from donors where even board members can be personally sued. Um, improper use of those uh, contributions can cause penalties from the IRS, even the loss of the tax exempt status, wow. um, even audit findings for organizations that have audits. Um, so it's really important to honor that intent. Um, even if it's just for the reputation of the nonprofit, yeah. um, because it really could impact your future fundraising efforts and the donor's trust mm -hmm. in, in your fiduciary responsibility. You know, I love that you, you brought this back to that issue of, you know, your, your uh, community support, how you're viewed. And one thing that circles around my mind is the, the aspect that you said in the very beginning, and, and it's also communicate. It's communication. You yeah. know, you need to keep you need to keep in contact with these donors so that you can have that courageous conversation or explain how something's changed or how a need has evolved. Um, because I love what you said. Donors want to move things forward and when they want to help, but they don't want to read about it on the front page of the newspaper. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so. Part and parcel to that, and this is a big thing, you know, and again, you are an accountant, so no surprise there, but help us understand a little bit more about tracking these restricted contributions, because you mentioned something that was really interesting to me under the two buckets, time, and then I'll call it task, like where you want the money to go. How, how do we look at this with those parameters? Yeah, so it's really important on the onset of a nonprofit accepting contribution to really evaluate how they're going to track uh, these restricted contributions. And a lot of it is driven <laughs> by the donor or the funders reporting requirements, okay. um, but also uh, an important aspect to evaluate is 
your overall capacity of your accounting department. Um, so what, what type of accounting system do you have? I mean, there's some that are really robust in terms of fund accounting, but like many of our clients uses QuickBooks, which isn't your traditional fund accounting software, but it can be leveraged to use existing mechanisms, tracking mechanisms, so that you can get the reports that you need. So you kind of need to evaluate um, how often am I tracking? How granular should that tracking be? Am I uh, tagging every transaction that we're expending to a particular donor? Or am I, or am I just doing periodic adjustments based off of the reporting requirements? And so, you know, like I mentioned, your, your accounting department's capacity really comes into play um, when, when evaluating how you're going to track and how often. But it's really, it, it can be a cost that should be evaluated at the onset of accepting that contribution. So as we're going into looking at this even more, when we're looking at evaluating restricted contributions, and I mentioned in the green room chatter that we're, he, we're, we're seeing this concept being rebranded as trust philanthropy, mm -hmm. meaning you know that we're gonna say to our donors, we're not going to be doing as many restricted uh, donations and contributions as we are going to say, you got to trust us. And here's what our mission, vision, and values are, and this is how we're going through it. But talk to me about evaluating this because you brought up something that's a hard cost, and that's just tracking it. Yes, we absolutely. Could be spending a chunk of our money on on the administrative side. Absolutely. I mean, so a restricted contribution can be a very important source of support for furthering the organization's mission, but it can have its challenges. And so, you know, evaluating um, your current uh, general and admin costs, um, you know, for an organization that may be struggling um, in um, just funding for overhead, um, maybe this donor restricted fund isn't the best thing to accept right now if you don't have that capacity. Um, but also, um, you know, if uh, you're evaluating um, whether this restriction really goes um, to further um, an important mission in your organization or some strategic plan, so building up some type of infrastructure for your long-term goals, it really should be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Because if you're accepting a donation for kids' backpacks, um, but you know you're working on you know medical infrastructure, that it might not be the right fit in terms of um, accepting that contribution. So I think it's really important for accounting and development and the management to really have these conversations internally to make sure they're on the same page. Um, that there is a policy for accepting these types of contributions um, and that everyone's kind of um, understanding the implications on the overhead cost, the personnel cost, and can the organization really support um, out honoring this donor intent? Right. You know, it's, it's two, makes me think of two things, you know, donor or mission creep that you you want to take the money and you see the money, you see the check. Right. And so you're like, oh yeah, we can do that right. when really you can't. And you, it, right. but it's so hard for us. We struggle so much to get money in the door. And yes. what you're saying is like, it's, it's like a tough, it's a tough thing to hear Amina, but yes. I think you're right. And I really love that you said bringing in management development and accounting and having that be a you know a more robust conversation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a it's a tough fundraising world out there, and there's a lot of competition for funds. Um, but even you know, in terms of some things that I've seen as well, is sometimes the organization can restrict funds unintentionally in terms of their solicitation of funds or their appeals that go out or even in um, their grant uh, applications or budgets using wording that are too restrictive or um, not general enough. 
you know, when donors respond to that, those funds are restricted. Um, so coming up with kind of a strategy in terms of, like you said, building that donor trust mm -hmm. so that they're giving you funds that support that mission, but are not very specific so that your, your hands are tied with how you can spend those funds. I'm fascinated by that because it seems to me that most um, organizations to your point, marketing or having a drive or running a campaign, um, probably don't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, they probably think, oh, the money comes in. I mean, I've seen more and more um, organizations that will literally make a, a policy that says for every dollar in, so much is going to go to this, this, this and that, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. in endowment. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of donors, that's kind of a scandalous thing because they don't want to fund endowment necessarily they want to put their money into action right now as opposed into the future i mean what are you seeing about that yeah and you know a lot of um what i'm seeing now is nonprofits actually being open about hey there is a cost to yeah. programming yeah. you know these programs can <laughs> run themselves we need buildings and lights and personnel to deliver these program costs and so incorporating a realistic even overhead percentage cost and being honest about that to donors educating your donors um, i think i've been seeing more and more um, so that donors are educated like those kids backpacks um you know they have to get distributed somehow yeah. um, and, and 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 you guys need to help us with that um, curveball, but do you can you give us kind of a guideline for what you think might be a good way to look at this in terms of some of those percentages? You know, I think it depends. Um, for some of my clients, I've actually done analysis of um, kind of what their programs are and what the cost um, is to support those and really come up with the percentages based off of your actual data. So I think it might it might depend on you know, how much funding you already have that covers your overhead. Um, because if, you, if you're well-funded in GNA, you know, it may not be um, a big deal to incorporate a high percentage when you're asking donors. But if not, you know, um, having that conversation with donors and, and coming with a realistic percentage, um, not just a general 10% you know, off, the, off, the, off the head, but really doing that analysis to make sure that you know, it's covering those personnel costs, a percentage of, you know, the lights and the utilities or anything that you may need. I like that you said that because I, I also think it makes you more of a trustworthy partner for any uh, philanthropist. If you're, you're like, yeah, this, this is what it takes. I mean, most of us who donate to nonprofits, we don't really have any idea what's going on. I mean, how hard the work is. I mean, how many of us you know, maybe contribute to shelter services, but have ever been in a shelter, right? right. So, right. I mean, I, I like what you're saying here. And, and I think that's a, a valiant way to kind of look at this is to say, this is going to go pretty far with our, our trust factor and our communication factor, and maybe even get more engagement from our donors. I mean, do you Absolutely. think that's realistic? I do. I do. I think, I think, you know, keep going back to that point that you made about communication and engaging with your donors. I think they want to be engaged. You know, I, I'm a donor. I want to know. I want to know when there's a need that maybe isn't as sexy as a specific programming need right. um, so that I can, I can help. And I think that um, transparency really helps donors to feel like they're um, a part of um, providing what your your greatest needs are. I mean, and now as, you know, being a nonprofit accounting, yeah. now I never restrict my donations. Okay, um, that was my <laughs> next question. That's so funny because that was exactly what was bubbling up in my head. Yeah. I was going to ask you two things. What are you as a private donor doing? And then my second part of that was, do you see this as maybe a cultural or a demographic issue? So for example, older donors versus younger donors, donors maybe from different parts of the country. Um, do you see any anything that might indicate that there's some swings there? 
You know, I don't, I don't know if I personally have um, noticed any demographic uh, differences. Um, I think that there's been a drive for evaluating nonprofits like the Charity Navigators. And so, you know, there's, there's been a historical push to, we want to see high programming costs and low, you know, admin and fundraising costs. And so that really um, drives donors to to want to see those high percentages. But because I, I know, you know, I've had a variety of nonprofit clients, I know that, you know, the need, there's a need there um, for just those overhead costs. As a donor now, I'm like, whatever the greatest need is, you know, I do my research. And if I trust the organization and the leadership, then I trust that you know, it's going to be used to deliver those services um, in the right way. Well, you know, like we were saying earlier, you know, this this new language of, of trust philanthropy, mm-hmm. it's getting people on board to understand that there are costs involved in doing the, these, uh, the, you know, providing these services and the mission, vision and values can be great and tug at your heart, but there's a reality to delivering service. Absolutely. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. You know, it it's, uh, seems to me as, as well that um, overall as a sector, it doesn't seem to me that we're reporting enough or not reporting, but maybe collecting data enough on how much of this is, you know, restricted versus non-restricted. And I know that we will see in budgets that come out uh, annual reports from organizations about that. But is that something that we're not talking enough about or we don't understand it? Why why isn't this at the forefront? That is a really good question. Um, I, I think that more and more I'm seeing, you know, more nonprofits push back on this, more philanthropists talk about this um, in the recent, um, recent news. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know because it's it's a really important issue um, because, you know, I can't tell you how many organizations are well-funded in the restricted funds um, and are struggling to, to, you know, to, to make payroll. And so, um, so it's, it's really um, something that I think should be in the forefront. And one, one thing that I also wanted to mention, you know, when I do budgeting for, for, for some of my nonprofits, mm-hmm. I try to separate out those specific nonprofit, those specific donor restricted contributions and expenses okay. from the general, general and administrative budget to kind of give a clear picture to my clients on uh, what are the costs and funding needs for our, our GNA versus, you know, you know, how well funded we are here. And, and that can also inform the strategy of how, you know, uh, they, they're getting funds or the funds that they're going after are willing to accept. Mm-hmm. Super smart, because again, that helps bring the conversation forward to let people even think about this. Cause I don't think we, I don't think we discuss this enough. Yes. You know, and it, it's somewhat of a mystery. And then to your point, you can be super well funded on one side of things and then scrambling on the other. And yeah, I also learned a lot today from you about the concept of really moving forward on that communication piece. Um, I loved what you had to say about most donors are going to want to help move the organization forward. They just need to know how. And if they can understand that maybe they're not putting their money to the best investment level, they can make a change. Absolutely. Um, and so I think, I just think that um, nonprofits sometimes can be afraid to have that conversation with them. <laughs> and and I think that um, we just need to be more forthright in having that conversation. Um, because even, you know, I've, I've, I've advised a client before who created a specific budget for for a grant proposal and it was for a brand new program and the budget was delineated very specifically we're going to hire this specific staff person um and in the end the needs by the time the program was rolled out the needs changed and the donor would have been perfectly fine in just 
you know, having a line item for staff salaries, not a specific, um, you know, staff position, but because it was written that way, you had to go back and, you know, make sure that it was okay with the donor. Um, so, you know, I, I just think that um, donors are more on board um, once they really understand and trust the needs of the organization. And so I think it's really a cooperative effort between, you know, the development department and, and accounting and management kind of having that unified strategy to get those funds. Yeah. Do you find that, um, because this is now the second or third time you've mentioned that, do you find that development is coming back to accounting and saying, woohoo, we got this. Yes. <laughs> Before you're like, wait a minute, we yes. just talked about this. <laughs> I mean, how do you navigate that? Yes, that has happened um, quite a few times um, yeah. where development's like, hey, we've gotten this, these funds. Now we can use it on this. And we're like, no, we can't because look at how it was written or look at how it was funded. And so I, I think I mentioned it because it's really important to, to discuss those things, you know, to discuss the analysis of the accounting and what, what those actual percentages are before, you know, that solicitation is made. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's really interesting, Amina, because, you know, I think on the nonprofit show, we are so blessed. We get to talk to different people every day and finishing up our third year, going into our fourth year. It's been a lot of voices and we generally hear people talk and we talk about the relationship between the donor and development, but we don't often spend enough time talking about that triad internally of management, programming and development. Mm -hmm. um, because we're like, so, you know, we got to get the money. We got to get the money. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I really like that you kind of brought this home to say, no, wait, let's talk about this because we can go off the rails and then yeah. what a mess. And I can see why development can really lose favor with accounting. And then it's like, Oh, they're not going to let us do it. Or, you know, it creates, right. it creates a bad energy, I guess. Right. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So that communication needs to happen yeah. internally first, definitely. Cause it could be a really great partnership. Yeah. Yeah. It really could be. And I think to your point, and I loved what you had to say in the very beginning in that, it's the trust factor from the get go. And so if you don't honor the intent and you don't um, keep working on understanding the intent and navigating it as it might change, you put so much at risk. Absolutely. So much at risk. It's Too been much. amazing. Well, wow, you have been a delight to, to uh, meet and to have on. And uh, I've learned a lot today, Amina. I, I would say this could be kind of like a hair on fire show for me because I was like, oh, wait, I hadn't really thought of these things that way. And so thank you. Thank you for bringing forward so many interesting ideas and in, in different ways of looking at this. Amina Bell, associate with your part time controller. Maybe you'll be working with her in the future on partnerships with the entire your part time controller staff. Amina, you've been a wealth of knowledge and it's been a lot of fun having you on. So Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for having me on, Julia. I, I, it's been an honor, truly. Well, it goes by fast, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> <laughs> I know, even for me, I got to say. Again, everybody, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd herself, will be back with us shortly in the week. Again, we've had an amazing conversation today with an expert such as Amina Bell, because of our sponsors, and they include our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, and The Nonprofit Nerd. These folks are with us day in and day out, and it's a really exciting opportunity to learn things. I have to say, Amina, I learn something new every day. Awesome. I do too. It's yeah. been great, Julia. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, as we end this episode, we want to remind ourselves, our viewers, our listeners, our guests to stay well so you can do well. We'll see everybody back here tomorrow. Thanks, Amina. <laughs>